I had, I don't want to turn it into a personal experience hour, but I had two interesting experiences during that time. Um, kind of along these lines, like, not that whose job it is, you know, and maybe this isn't answering your question directly, um, because it is, it, to answer the question, people got to do their own stuff. They need to be able to ask questions, you know, to other people they know that trust, you know, or go to someone they know that's like, will come to me like, hey, you grew up, you know, like your best friend's Lamont, like, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, but, you know, this summer I had two interesting responses to a couple of things. Um, I was still using Facebook more than I do now. But I don't. Your life is a lot happier because of it, too. I bet. Yeah, it's a lot happier. <laughs> I have Zoom scrolling Twitter, too. <laughs> but I had two experiences um, that were kind of, they were rather illuminating in terms of why these problems persist. I said, I posted on Facebook one day, I said, just a memory of when I was a still working in education and I worked in a... Um, majority minority school um, in a very diverse district. Um, this district I worked in at their high school has 2,600 students in 77 languages in it, first languages. Um, huge refugee population, um, huge African American population um, among others. Um, and so very, very diverse. And I had um, several families. I, I had one African American family in particular this was the year of, I think, a year of Eddie Gray and Tamir Rice and, mm -hmm. and uh, Trayvon Martin and, and all that. And I had uh, Phil, uh, Phil Castile. I, yeah. I'm butchering his name. Uh, Phil Andrew uh, Castile in, yeah, uh, in Minnesota. Yeah, the, the gun owner in Minnesota, yeah. Yeah. And I had a mother come in one day. Um, the father, very... Uh, both parents worked, both parents had degrees, um, mother actually works for the court system. Um, Dan has a uh, very amazing family. And uh, this is, you know, just the fact that I said that is terrible. But um, one of the days after one of the shootings, she just comes in the office and just looks at me and she just, her shoulders just drop. I said, what's up? And I, and I knew what the problem was, right? Like. She was thinking the same thing I was actually thinking today. I was thinking about you. She mm -hmm. was thinking about her husband. Like, are they going to come home tomorrow? Right? And I remember this conversation. She just stood there for like an hour and we just sat together that day. And I posted that. And I got comments back that said, You're virtue signaling. You're just telling us you remember this. Like, well, of course I do. Like, that was a so powerful to just watch someone be so affected by the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then it turned into a, you're just trying to show us that you're better than us. Like, I'm telling you a story <laughs> about how someone was affected by, by the news and how it has real mental effects on people. And then there was a comment after George Floyd and it said, um, you know, the protests are still going on. And I think Derek Chauvin at this point had been charged. Yeah. And someone said, and it was a law student, said, uh, well, we all think this guy should be charged. We all think he was, uh, we all no, agree he was wrong. We all think he should be charged. Uh, he's been arrested. Uh, why is this still going on? <laughs> and I'm like, I know part of law school is like you learn to how you frame your question and how you frame your legal issue mm -hmm. to find your case, right? Like, how do you tell your story? What was the goal? How are you framing the story you're trying to tell and the problem you're trying to solve, right? This is classic, you know, with the, you know old, the late Justice Scalia was a master at this, turning a case into, you know, flipping the script of what the story was to fit his end goal of what he wanted the case to be decided. And I was just like, Justice Scalia couldn't have narrowed the issue that's narrow. <laughs> like, that was the, mm. but that was the picture to this person was, well, we all agree he murdered someone. He needs to go to prison. And that was it. 
there was no big picture. I and and, and that you know. that that is where it goes over people's heads because um the damn you can pop in anytime you want to uh is is we've seen situations where people have gotten arrested before like the cops that beat down Rodney King got arrested. You know what I mean? The two dudes who killed Emmett Till got arrested. That's not the problem. That's not where people have the issues. Is will they be charged and found guilty? Will the justice system that for decades and decades and decades have shown to be at best inconsistent, at worst downright cruel, will they prosecute one of their own? Will they take, and there has in recent times been a couple instances, I don't have it right in front of me where police officers have been charged and have been sent away and have been arrested. But for every one... But the police departments go, well, we arrested them. What, what more do you want from us? Right. You know, right. and that's, and that's, where, that's where there's that problem of, like, but you, but you allowed them, you know, to, like... And some of these guys have, you know, rough backgrounds when it is with, you know, uh, um, things on their records of things that have taken place. It's like, well, you, you still allowed those people to be on the force. You didn't take any actions, and now, well, now they killed somebody. Well, now you're like, okay, we arrested them, but then the system deal with them. So we're out of this, right? And it's that's not how that works. It's not how it works, and in in, and in, you know, bringing it back to the downriver situation, it's the police messes with white people too in downriver. Like that's the, like so that's what white I, people. But do. you hit the point, right? Like, what's the biggest part about you know, police versus community now? Whatever, the Gardner White Cop. Everybody talks about the Gardner White Cop. Uh, like everybody, no matter what's going on, the gardener white stopped you for doing forty six down telegraph. Yeah, everybody. It didn't matter who it was, right? This is not Lamont driving out of into Oakland County in a Kia Soul and immediately getting pulled over, <laughs> right? And this is a real story. A right? Allegedly real story, folks. Allegedly real story. <laughs> <laughs> everybody got pulled over. It didn't matter who it was. So <laughs> when you when you have that situation where they have a gardener white cop, the ninety four cop. Everyone gets pulled over, no matter what you look like, what you are. It creates this, this illusion that oh, there is no police brutality because we're all getting f with. Except the difference is, is that like George Floyd, I when I if I get pulled over or when I get pulled over, it's I was taught a different set of rules by my father. You know, what I'm saying of hey, hands on the steering wheel. When they come up, ask them, hey, I have my wallet here. Can I go get it, sir? I have my, my driver's license here. May I reach for it, sir? And I've had a few times where I've had my hands on the steering wheel <clears throat> and officers have asked me, you know, you know, do you have a gun or anything like that? I'm like, no, sir. He said, why do you have that? Because I want to make you feel comfortable, sir. I say, oh, okay. And 9.5 out of 10 times, I haven't had any issues with the police, but I have to follow these certain rules and guidelines. <clears throat> In comparison, I know people some wilding out at the police, cussing at them, yelling, yelling at them, giving my tickets, well, snatching right. things I out mean, their hands. I'm like, Ooh. part of yeah, part of my job, I see, uh, you know, cases where I I, I do a lot of uh, resisting officer cases, and a lot of times I'll look at something and go, "Wow, that person really mopped out to that cop." He got charged. He got convicted. Mm -hmm. He didn't get shot, though. He didn't, he didn't get, get shot. And then right. I look at somebody else, and the next case over, I'm like, man, he got tased and tackled and pretty <laughs> darn quickly. I'm not, not going to say what else was going on underneath those cases, but, you know, it's. It, I'm sure you can take a guess. Um, you know, I, if I ever, I don't get pulled over, but if, like, say, I know my, <laughs> you know, my father is a, is a concealed weapons carrier. I don't have a concern that he's going to get pulled over one day and he's going to get shot. Mm -hmm. You are, though, and I have every concern that you are. <laughs> right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you feel that way, but I do. Oh, trust me. Uh, me wearing all this black makes me, uh, you know, concerned every time I go out at night uh, <laughs> about, about, about the police. But, uh, you know, considering the things that we have to do today, to keep but saying let's go all that back. Stuff. Let's let's circle back to to I'm gonna hijack your show. I love it, man. Let's go back to what Damien said about going to a bar out of town when we were in high school. Uh, you, yeah, because I want his thoughts on that too. Damien and I were in band, and we took a senior this our senior year. We went to Disney World, and you came along as a groupie. Oh, <laughs> a roadie, no, roadie, roadie. Okay, roadie. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna bring up? Right. <laughs> 
I do know. Was, I do know. You, you know. you know what I'm ringing about? I do it know. Was like <laughs> 1 30 in the morning oh. on our way down. And we're in Georgia. Rural, rural Georgia. Deep we're South rural, Georgia. Deep South. Yeah. We're, we're in rural Georgia. Nowhere. I mean, we, no one can even tell you where we were. <laughs> no, we weren't in Atlanta. We'll tell you that. And like 1 30 in the morning, we stopped at a Cracker Barrel. You didn't get off that bus. I was not getting off that bus. <laughs> so, well, so, but exactly. All right. So compare that to, so this was, we were 17, 18 at the time. Right. Yeah. Versus a couple years ago, you and I went out to Iowa, central northern Iowa for a wedding. Right. Uh, where our African-American friend actually from down river, yeah. who very much stands out in his community. Yes. And you and I went to a diner and we looked around, we pulled in the parking lot and we're like, well, I'm, I'm, this is not to to put this down in any way. We're like, this is Donald Trump's America. Right. So what were your, I mean, were there your feelings any different between that first one and the second one? So my, my feelings with the first one, when we were, me, you, and Damien here on the screen, we were down in South Rural Georgia. You guys had to negotiate like you negotiate with a terrorist <clears throat> to get off that bus <clears throat> to go to go get some uh, some eggs. The, the, there was a feeling of being out of control in that scenario where I'm in deep Georgia and I have no exit plan. What am I going to do? Am I going to run through the woods of Georgia to figure this out? Like, even though we're on a, we're on a bus of now, people. But, but here, here's my thing, right, as you said. So here's my thing, though, is we're in deep Georgia, right? We we rolled, we, we had two full charter buses, right? Yeah, yes. You have two full charter buses, doors open, the buses just barrel out of there into, you know, into this crackle barrel to go eat. How many of those two full charter buses even had an idea of how you were feeling? Oh, just, it was just you two. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was and that, right. The school, and down river school. It, it was it was right and it, 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 and it right and it down river but in a down river school where nobody else even understood why you were hesitant to get off that bus and then when we, even if someone were to tell them you know Lamont's hesitant to get off the bus you know and even oh, if you wow. explain even if you explained it to them right they would still be should be like you know, we're the you, ones that supposedly are used to it right like, we're supposed to be from the school if you take your thesis that we're different. But in that moment, was it? In that in that particular moment, I guess it, we were all the same as the rest of of America. I guess the rest of parts of America. I guess I considered it different because I at least had two people on the opposite on the other side of Anglo ancestry that understood. I'm like, hey, look, I don't know if this is right for me. And you're like, come on, man, come get some pancakes. You'd be all right. Don't be crazy. But that's, but that's where you take you take, you know, a hundred plus kids of the same class, right? Remove them from Downriver, put them in the deep south, and then you add that race aspect, and they're oblivious. And that's how people get hurt too. That's how people get hurt. And, and I mean, we saw that in nineteen sixty four with the uh, the, th the three freedom riders who were driving down Mississippi. Because they didn't know any better. Because they didn't know the rules down there. And they ended up getting killed and stuff. Uh, but to answer your question about the Iowa. So it, what I remember specifically about the Iowa is that I think I had a knife on me. Because um, I, yeah. was, I wasn't worried, per se, that something was going to happen. Because it's the 20, 21st century. So, right, so we don't have these public lynchings like we used to. And right. I didn't think that in broad daylight something was going to happen. But... Um, I was always in the back of my mind, like, you know, are they going to put us next to the bathroom? Because that's a move that happens, right? They put you in the worst spot in the restaurant, you know, are they going to put you <coughs> next to the door so you get to, you get to the draft, you know, all the time? Or or <clears throat> do you not get your coffee, your drink in a yeah, normal less, time? At less desirable location, right. less desirable service. Right, do you get less service? Because I, I felt anxious about how you get treated I, I i don't think i've ever actually asked you whether you felt you, you were in that moment now I, me personally i i have 
been able to develop a, I guess, an aura around me to whereas when I'm in those situations, I'm so comfortable being around other white people, but I'm the only pepper in the salt bowl that I know how to diffuse <laughs> whatever your situation is. I can diffuse that to the point to whereas, okay, you're not even thinking about it. That and Kevin Hart has really helped these days. Really <laughs> helped. It. A lot. However, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's, let's, hang on, I'm going to turn this back on you. <laughs> because, because this is why we're gonna have three parts, Damien. I told you we gonna have three parts. Of this. Because as much as we have experienced two different white cultures, the okay. culture that we're the, the we're all used to diversity culture and the oblivious to the world, right? Uh, that other people ex- that don't look like you exist world. Um, you've always lived in two worlds. Yes. And I, something tells me that your experience too is not normal. There's either African Americans who live in quote white society, who live in upper middle class or upper class white neighborhoods that go to big white schools. There's those three kids at every big high school. And then there's black students who go to all black schools. You always, I don't want to call it code switched, but have lived in both worlds. You feel you are as unique as you think we are in this situation. You know what? I'm not going to disagree with that. I mean, I've always, I feel like I belong to, to no one and everyone. Like I was able to, growing up, being the shorter, darker kid, smarter kid, I felt like I had to adapt to certain situations and conform to certain situations, right? And so I went through those phases where I was like the emo black slash white kid. <laughs> Wearing Jinko jeans. <clears throat> <That's gross. laughs> Wearing Jinko jeans for no reason, right? And then I'd be, uh, I went through that Emma Crombie and Fitch black white dude phase for some reason where you guys took me into American Eagle and I, I did you not. You walked out in 30 seconds. <laughs> I did <laughs> half of the right. song. All right. But growing up, I was able to, <laughs> yeah, Damien took me to Hollister one time and uh, and the mist hit me in the face <laughs> as I was making fun of the $85 jeans and stuff that were all ripped up. I told him I couldn't do it for $5, right? <laughs> I've, I have never been able to, I guess, feel comfortable up until my adult age, right? Because when I hit 26, 27, like it didn't matter. But when I was younger, I was never able to feel completely comfortable in either scenario, but I was able to find a good niche in the middle, right? People from both sides were able to accept who I was because I I didn't try to pretend to be blacker than the next black person, but I also didn't try to pretend to be like Carlton from Will Smith. See what I'm saying? I was able to kind of hover in the middle of both worlds. I was smart enough to hover in the middle of both worlds. Okay, so you just, you just led right into the next question. Ah, he's a lawyer. Ah, I see. I don't like this. He's a lawyer. You just called it two worlds. And I've never experienced this. I've known you for 24 years now. Ish. True, but you've never had to, you've never had to conform to two worlds. Like, that's the difference. And that's the difference. Right. No, I, I know. I've never crossed in the other, into your other world. Well, because if you did, and we've seen that video of Damien dancing, so we know what this looks like at college and stuff. Yeah, he knows what I'm talking about. If, if, so like example, so there was someone I was talking to before <clears throat> where they had uh, a kid in their department. Um, he didn't feel comfortable because he was trying to, he was trying to interact with the blacker, the black blacker, with the black <laughs> um, coworkers, try to adapt. And it was almost coming off as offensive because the way he was trying to do it wasn't right. Okay. It it seemed almost as mockery. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. You guys have never had to adapt to being uh, in a situation where you were the minority, no matter where you're at. You know what I'm saying? Because even if you're in Detroit, in the middle of Detroit, you're still the majority. Even if you're not the majority in that moment, society-wise, you're still the majority. If something happens, you're still the majority. You see what I'm saying? Whereas myself, I've had to, and alas, a lot of people of color had to do, 
adjust to the world around us, right? So that's where you get those statements of, oh, you're, 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 what is it? You're the whitest black guy I know. And I used to tell people, well, yeah, because if I walked around like 50 cent, you would have this pre notion about me that right. is or is not true. You know what I'm saying? Or Lamont, you talk white, you know, why? Because I enunciate, you see what I'm saying? Because I was able to conform to the world around me. A lot of people don't. A lot of people say F it. But those of Caucasia, as I as I make up that word, you don't have to. You can you can just ride your life as you want to. Now, the world that you guys have to contend to, or you guys have to, and this is I really just kind of leads up to my next question. You didn't answer my question. I did answer the question. You, no, you just didn't like you just you just didn't no. like the way I answered it. You just no, didn't like the way I answered it. This is my show, sir. All right. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, Don't bring a lawyer. A lawyer this, 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 this is my show. This is my uh -huh. show, sir. Oh, do you feel you had to to to, to change into two worlds? Because you really did. No, no, no. What I'm asking is, you have never mixed the two worlds. You have never brought your Caucasian world, dominant world, and your black world together. I did that for those worlds. I did that one for those worlds because I didn't know how those worlds were gonna mix. And I did that for myself because I didn't know how I was going to be able to interact in all those worlds spinning together. Okay. But see, that is interesting. That, that's that's that'll be another episode. Dive dive <laughs> into into Lamont's, Lamont's world of of his code switching, as you call it. All right, this is my show, sir. Okay, Damien. Now that we finally twenty <laughs> minutes later, <laughs> minutes later. Now that we're here, Damien. Uh, did you? Yeah, thanks. Did you? Uh, we're gonna edit this out too. Cause I'm the one doing the editing. Did you want to talk about your college, your, your college white situation with with those who who um, who had never been around a person of color, or did you just did you, did you want to? Because I was we supposed to ask you that 25 minutes ago. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Honest, I can't honestly say I, I've, I've ever met, and, and on the college campus that is, that I've never I've never actually met somebody who's not at least you know, interacted with or has been around, you know, somebody, you know, who, somebody who's African-American. But that does bring me to, you know, I was in a Greek organization uh, at Central, you know, University, and I was on the, the, the social Greeks. And I would say 99%, 98, 99% of that Greek organization as a whole were white. Mm-hmm. You know, you had that two percent, you know that that you know that were African American. However, we did have this totally separate outside. They were part of the interfraternal council, but they were totally outside of the social groups that were all black, you know, fraternities. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see these on TV and you see these on you know like in the movies and stuff like that. But there there really was no interactions between the two groups. You know, it was very, even on campus, segregated between what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, our Greek organization, we had um, athletics where all the fraternities would compete against you, you know, against each other. None of those fraternities were a part of that. We had Greek week where a fraternity and a sorority teamed up together and throughout the week you competed against, you know, other teams and you put together mock rock, which is a dance, you know, show at the end of the week and all this mm -hmm those groups weren't a part of that. Interesting. You know, you have all of these things that, you know, we actually had a council that overseen the Greek organizations and stuff. They weren't a part of that. Hmm. Which is what's interesting is because you have, you know, the African-Americans who did want to join a group, but their group really wasn't incorporated because obviously the social Greeks were the largest on campus. Did you ever run into any problems with them saying anything or, 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 or though people in their leadership going to the other parts of like other Greek fraternities say, hey, how come we don't intermingle? Or was it just one of those things that were people just kind of accepted for what it was? People just kind of accepted it for what it was. So before camp, before uh, uh, the before the, um, the semester started, so in, in the fall, um, you know, we had this huge thing outside of, you know, the football stadium where it was kind of new freshmen during orientation. Their parents would be there. New freshmen would be there. They'd go around and they'd be meeting all these organizations. You know, any organization that was on campus had the right to be there and had a table and all this stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Even in such situations like that, here's the Greek corner. Okay, well, here's the social Greeks. Okay, well, here's the other Greeks. Mm-hmm. You know, so even then, but it was just no, nobody said anything. Nobody really batted an eye on it. Yeah, you know, at it, it was just they separated and, and it was never mentioned. It was never talked about. It was never discussed. Yeah, that's real. That's real. It's interesting, but then it's not. And, and the reason why I say it's not, because even at the end of the day, like as human beings, we tend to congregate with those who look like us and those who act like us. You know what I'm saying? Because even going back to Taylor High School, like we remember the lunch tables, right? Like our lunch table was the rare lunch table where we had different nationality, different gender bases and, 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 right. and races together. But mostly... Black people ate with the black people, <laughs> and white people <laughs> ate wherever they. Well, were. even in the hallway, right? There was one spot where a lot of the black students hung out. Right, a group of lockers that they just you they know, just gradually hang out. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, I, I, I know, could be remembering it wrong, some people called it Compton, didn't they? That was Truman. <laughs> that was it, Truman. <laughs> yeah, it was Truman. But but see, the question always then come came to my mind, you know, when I look back was. That two percent of the African Americans that did join that, that, that those social groups were they looked upon differently by the all you know by the all African American you know fraternities and sororities? Did they look at them differently because they chose to to join those groups opposed to theirs? I mean, that's an interesting question, right? Because now you're talking into words like sellout. You know what I mean? Like, and right. that's that's a tough that's a tough thing to, to that's a tough thing for me sitting here or standing here to say. That, yeah, that's what they thought they were, that they were sellout or the more commerce you're trying to be white. You know what I'm saying? Why are, why are you yeah. trying to be white? Why can't you be comfortable with being being with us? Um, so we always have the stereotypes, uh, you know, the stereotypical frat guy wears Sperry's and khakis. and mm-hmm. wearing Sperry's and khakis right now. You know, and, that, <laughs> and a polo shirt and, you know, and things like that. You know, that, that was the social Greeks, you know. And, you know, the other groups weren't they didn't dress like that. They didn't kind of conform to that image. And well, those two percenters, they did kind of did. Mm-hmm. Right. Those two percent, you did see wearing Sperry's. They were, they're wearing khakis and a, you know, a blazer and a, and a, and a dress, you know, a polo and button up at the bar, you know? So, right. The, so the word, you know, that, that mentality of, you know, are they a sellout? You know, at the time, I never thought about it. But, you know, looking back, you kind of do stop and think, you know, you know, what was thought about that? I mean, sell is such a rough word because I would I would just say it's conformality, right? It's like you see the world where the only way to be successful is to dress like those who you believe will take you to success, right? And so if the, the fraternity that will garner the most success wears Sperry's and has this tie-off sweater – then I will wear the Sperry's and wear the tie-off sweater. Now, for me is I would rather the, that 2% wear the tie-off sweater and the Sperry's and be comfortable with who they are than to try to get a daishiki and, and, a, kute, and a kente cloth and go hang out with the black groups because that's what they're supposed to do, quote-unquote. You see what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have that 2%, then you never get the interactions that we talked about before where you never get the black culture with the white culture, even if that's a black culture that's diluted, you never get that. You know what I mean? So, and, and that's what you need. You need that 2%. Um, it's just, it's, it's interesting to hear that. I guess it is. And it's not to hear that um, the student body itself or that the school itself just is like, yeah, no, just y'all just deal with it. <laughs> y'all, it y'all, y'all, y'all just kind of deal with how you do it. Handle but, it how you want to. Yeah. I mean, but you know, you, you, so you're there. You get your degree, degree, as I like to call it. You come back. Uh, Keith has been there and the West Side with his with his corn, and and now is his Huskies and stuff. Uh, Dame, you you start a family. Um, you live in, um, you know, I, I guess we would say it, and not an affluent part of Down River, but a higher quality of Down li- Down River. Um, you know, with that, with, with your family and stuff, you know, how do you how do you look at Down River today compared to to 10, 20 years ago? Well, it's interesting now because obviously with the kids and the kids are in school and and the area that I'm at is a very school of choice landing spot. You know, everybody wants to send their kids, you know, to our school district. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it is a very popular 
location to send other kids no matter what other downriver area you're at that's kind of where you want them to go mm-hmm. but and with that you know we have a very very diverse um population a very very diverse classroom for colton that is to where he you know but it's not just african-american we now have a lot of hispanics you know we now have a lot of middle eastern kids that are in his classroom now you know to where I get a lot of questions from Colton. I'm just like, you know, you know, this, you know, this little boy's name is, name is Jesus <laughs> you know, or, or this little boy's name is angel. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you know, obviously having a little daughter, Colton's thinking of like an angel. He's like, you know, it's, that's a girly thing. It's, mm-hmm. So you kind of got to like, and, and now I'm, I'm teaching him outside of just, you know, African-Americans, but now they're just, as a whole minorities, you know, so it's, it's definitely different, but it's, it's kind of the same. It's just on a broader scale of of the, of the minority population. You know, you bring up a point and I'm going to ask different people that might make this a segment. Um, you know, you as a Caucasian male, you know, how do you, how do you teach your Caucasian son of the world that he's he's grown into or that he's living in today? Because whether it's whether he realizes it or not, he will be blamed because he is Caucasian, because he is male. He will get blamed for a lot of things that have happened in this country and on this planet. I'm very curious. And if you don't have a, a, a this is definitely one of those questions where it's like, yo, I need to I need to take a couple of days to think about it, because to to raise a son. It's one thing to raise, like I said, the black son and said, hey, this is a society. This is what we have to do to survive. This is what we have to do to, to become successful and move on. And those things have definitely changed as 2021 technology, such and such and such. But then you take the other side. I'm doing the thing that people don't want me to do is I'm asking the Caucasian male, hey, your son is the next generation of, of unifier, of, of those who will, who will eventually have us not worry about um, racial warfare, I guess what I like about a better term. How do you teach him or how do you walk him through, I guess, with breadcrumbs to say, hey, you know, this is how we, you know, this is how we, we deal with um, the diversity that we have. I mean, obviously, a big, po- a big positive is the fact that you come over all the time, you know. So, but, so he's, he is just, he has become very accustomed to there being others other than just whites in the neighborhood you know when you're asking keith about you know the conversation with people who've never seen a black guy before Mm -hmm. luckily he's never going to have to have that you know he sees you on you know a youtube or your other channel and he just oh that's lamont doesn't think nothing of it just he sees you out that that's him and he kind of moves on this day and he doesn't see you any differently just because so that is a good positive aspect because he does see you but you also, yeah, you bring up a good point of like, how do I sit him down and have that conversation of like, just because you have that thought, thought process, you have that mentality, you have that, you know, you're very comfortable and in, in, in that, how do I have that conversation of, but you're still going to get blamed. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had that to talk before where it was, where I see it a lot is, is, you know, hey, you blaming me for being white, that's racist. And I'm like, wait a minute, let's, why are we acting like children right now? Why are we trying to oversimplify <laughs> something that is, that is a real issue? But yeah, me, you have talked about before, especially the last couple of years where we've had our, our political talks, not to, not to throw your politics out there, but we had our political talks and, and people have called you a bigot. You're like, oh, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're this, you're that. And I'm like, well, no, he's not. He's, he's one of the most open minded white dudes I know. But because you're Caucasian, because you're male, they have this I can't natural, say that. Right. You have this natural yeah. assumption of who you are. And so with with other people, that can instill resentment and anger and hatred. And they teach that to the next generation. Um, I know you're obviously not, not that type of person, but it is still the same scenario where you still have to teach that next generation, your son and your daughter, like, hey, this is this is what right now it is. This is how we handle it. This is how we deal with it, you know? 